Uh, my name is Kayla McDonough, and I'm Chief Education Officer for Prepper Foundation, where I work at the in intersection of innovation and education, helping individuals, teams, and organizations develop the skills they need to create new solutions and succeed in a rapidly changing world. And that's definitely the world that we're finding ourselves in right now. Um, through that work, I've been very fortunate to lead many discussions similar to the one we're having today. But this topic is one I'm particularly passionate about. Um, my education is in human health sciences, and a lot of my recent work has been in how do we better leverage data and various technologies. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. First, I would like to welcome Dr. Shiko Gatao, the CEO of Kala, a digital innovation company that catalyzes digital transformation capabilities for organizations across Africa. She has over 10 years of experience in the research, design, implementation, and management of digital technologies. She has established expertise in both African and emerging markets, specialized in solving problems in agriculture, education, health, payments, retail, and renewable energies. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Um, I would also like to welcome Dr. Dunstan Matakenya. Dr. Dunstan Matakenya is a consummate data scientist with over 10 years experience in both traditional statistics and modern machine learning methods. Currently, he works as a data scientist at the World Bank Group, headquartered in Washington, DC. Prior to joining the World Bank, Dr. Dunstan completed his PhD at the University of Tokyo in 2016. His PhD research focused on the use of machine learning methods to explore insights from mobile phone data. Welcome to both of you, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So before we get into the questions, I just want to provide a bit of context to frame today's discussion. Um, we know that data is crucial to understanding the spread of the pandemic and ultimately creating solutions that are informed by facts to curb the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we've seen a range of applications already emerging, so from contract tracing to population modeling to predict vulnerable populations to understanding how to better distribute vaccines. In today's panel, we're going to be exploring this top, these topics and more in greater depth and ultimately understanding how data can be used to scale and support the African healthcare system. So let's jump into it. Um, I want to start today's discussion by you know, thinking about how do we how can we leverage big data and how has that contributed to our understanding of COVID-19 from a public health perspective? Uh, perhaps, Dr. Shiko, you can get us started on this. Um, so I, I love this topic uh, very much and thank you for having me, uh, the, the organization of the next and fun, uh, instant forum. So first of all, when, when you talk about data and big data, I mean, there's always like a confusion or, I mean, it's a buzzy word. Many organizations are talking about big data. So what is big data? Big, big data is the use of like a lot of data to help in decision making. Because I always say, if you have a lot of data and you're talking about big data and it's not helping move the needle and making decision making, you have decision making, it's not helping anybody. It's innovation that helps combine lots of data sets to help governments or decision makers make their decisions in a very precise way that is going to help and save lives in this case uh, of COVID. And sometimes it's making money. So how has uh, big data been used in, uh, in in COVID response? A lot of ways. So we can, we can go all the way down to Singapore in the very beginning when they use data to contract trace every single person and basically reduce um, the the spread of, uh, of, of um, COVID quite significantly in, in, in Singapore. And uh, in Africa, we, we I mean, the, the pandemic came to us a little bit late, or at least it, it, got, it got started t being tested a little bit late. And we had adapted many of these lessons around contact tracing, using mobility data to be able to find people and find where they are, where do they live, and, and make, sure, make sure that the, the, the pandemic does not spread. In Kenya, specifically, where I worked and still are working, on, uh, on, on using data for decision making, we, we used a number of data sets to be able to inform government decisions from the very beginning. The first one was, how is this uh, pandemic going to affect the economy of Kenya? So the first thing we did is to look at our population data. What's the spread of, of, the, of, of, of the population in the country? Who are the most at risk? The people with uh, diabetes, the people with uh, high blood pressure, people with HIV. At that point, HIV was seen as a huge, um, as a huge uh, uh, problem when it comes to 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 the pandemic. And just mapping this out, and the government seeing it 
okay, this is our highest risk areas and how do we work this out was a big win and that was in the first week. And when as the, as the pandemic started progressing, we started using data from the private sector. I'm, I'm very grateful to Facebook and, and Uber who provided their data and, and Bolt, all the, the taxi companies who provided their, their data quite generously, to be honest, for us to be able to map out how are people, how are Kenyans moving. We actually did, we did an experiment even with the Ugandan data at some point, is how Africans moving between the cities, between each other, to just tell the government if, if we don't do something really soon, this is how the trajectory is going to happen. So, for example, let me give, give you an example. Uh, the pandemic was announced on 12th of, of March in Kenya, and then there was another announcement a week later. When we looked at mobility data of urban rural migration, it was higher, much, much higher than the Christmas period the previous two years how people moved, moved back home because they thought i've seen the close down in europe this is most likely going to happen and what happens if the pandemic would have actually hit in kenya people have moved the pandemic back to the villages so that's how data is used to actually inform and when the lockdown happened it happened immediately for nairobi because we we had data showing people will move if we, we say you're giving you 24 hours so people the, the government made like a radical decision to close down the cities almost immediately. And for me, that is the radicality of using data in a very precise way to save the continent. And you can see that the pandemic did not have as much effect, at least the first wave of it, did not have, a, had, have as much effect as it had in other places in the world. Big data innovation, in a, in, in a sense, just focuses on uh, these kind of ways of using the old data in different ways uh, with new methods, but also using these new data sources like telecom data, which you can use to monitor mobility. Um, so just as an example of how, um, so just to mention, uh, to, 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 to remind the audience that I am at the World Bank, so I work with different countries in Africa as well as other parts of the world. So we are always using different types of data in, uh, in public health. But specifically for COVID-19, we've seen use of mainly telecom data in, um, in different countries for several uses. Of course, one is contact tracing. I have uh, uh, two use case countries, but unfortunately due to the um, confidentiality and sensitivity of the data, I can't mention the name of those countries. But just to mention that there are some countries in Africa who are using telecom data to do contact tracing. So as we know, contact tracing is uh, super important for dealing with the spread of COVID-19. So just to mention that, yes, there are some countries who are using this kind of large scale data coming from cellular phone companies to help with contact tracing. Um, and then there are also other countries who are using telecom data to just monitor mobility of the of the population. So, for example, to uh, so if a country institutes like lockdown, you, you want to make sure that people are sticking to the lockdown measures. So, mobility data coming from the telecom companies can be used to uh, to monitor if the population is sticking to the um to the lockdown measures but other than that so uh there are also some knockdown effects or due to uh due to covid 19 people are staying home businesses are closing so they are people who need support like who need uh, financial support due to the uh, uh negative uh, economic effects of the covid 19 so the World Bank is also involved in supporting countries to make sure that they provide some financial support to, to their population or to their citizens. So this is the area called social protection. Uh, so where essentially the government can do cash transfers to the people. So when you have this project, one of the issues is how to identify the beneficiaries how to do the payments. So in this area, big data is also being used very actively in country, in some countries in Africa, for example, to, to do digital payments using platforms like Impesa uh, and just uh, uh, other mobile, uh, mobile money payment systems to pay money to beneficiaries. And then the, the data can also be used to actually help in identifying the beneficiaries. 
So those are some of the, the, the uses of big data in, uh, in, in public health and COVID-19 that I'm seeing uh, that we are, we are working with at the World Bank. And of, of course, I just also forgot, of course, the epidemiological modeling, which in the modern age of big data is benefiting a lot from the same data coming from mobile devices. So um, let me leave it there, Kathleen, for now, just uh, introducing some of those uh, use cases of uh, a big data or just trying to define what, what we mean by big data in the context of public health. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I think you hit on some really important points. And I think you both did, right? This idea of big data and the term of it, right? In many ways, it is a buzzword. It's something that a lot of people throw around, but like really starting to dissect it and understand it, I think is very, very important. Understanding what it is and, and also what, what its limitations are. And we're going to talk about, you know, data sources and that sort of thing in a minute here. Um, but before we move on to that, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Shiko, if you can speak a little bit about innovation and what it means. Uh, Dunstan certainly gave us some context and some examples like around contact tracing. I know you touched on it a little bit around um, you know, how it was used early on from a mobility perspective. But perhaps you can speak to it further, like what innovation means to you in a data context and, and what solutions have you seen that have been emerging using data um, and in some of your work? Let's separate innovation and, and, and big data innovation first of all and just like a proper lecture, define them separately. Innovation is um, is reuse of knowledge i always say it's either uh creation of new knowledge of reuse or reuse of knowledge in a in a in a, in a completely new manner because sometimes innovation does not mean creating something totally new it means repurposing something for, for, for a different context and if we take that as the meaning of innovation and big data it's the same way is is big data being used uh, being this huge set of data, depending on it, if it's personal data, mobility data, weather data, health data, all this data, is how do you use this data in a different context? Data being the knowledge that you have. How do you either create new forms of data or, or use utilize this data in a different manner? And utilizing data in a different manner means can, can, can mean uh, combining different data sets to get new new forms of insights. So I'll give you an example of, um, of I mean, COVID, COVID threw a spanner in the works in terms of public health and a response to public health. It kept changing all the time. It kept changing uh, the, the disease description itself and definition kept changing month on month, especially in the very early stages uh, of the of the of the pandemic. And you'll be hearing stuff from all the China noticed this, and then Europe has seen something totally different. And these are all different data 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 sets that are, were, were were being produced. And what do you what, what do you do in Kenya when? when you're hearing this, you start collecting this data and, and trying to understand how do how how can I complement our health system to be able to see if this pattern is seen somewhere else. So for example, the one thing that we did was to track down the cases of pneumonia in the last three years in Kenya and see is it, are we going through a real pandemic or is, or is it a pneumo another a pneumonia uh, a pneumonia outbreak and by doing that we're saying we, we had this data somewhere seated somewhere there but we're utilizing it in a in a different context to try and eliminate the possibility of a we've had COVID in the country for a long time and we just did not test enough and two what are the measures that we should be taking and questions like that that are using like existing knowledge to be applied to 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 a new context is what i feel innovation is the other interesting thing is how we we utilize different data sets from different places in the world. So, for example, the mobility data that we used uh, for, uh, from, the, from, from Facebook and Uber and Bolt and Little Cab uh, helped us like understand the different mobility movements. We used even Matatu data. Matatu, Matatu is, is public transport informal. Uh, that carries a lot of people. So we use even like uh, Matatu data to try and track down how are people moving around the country to try and see, can we track down the disease if it was there? We used weather data. We went we went back a few years and said, if we lay out, uh, uh, actually in June and July, where there was a bit of a spike of COVID before our second wave that just started a few weeks ago, there's a bit of spike. We wanted to check is this is is this an um a, a, a causation from weather changes or is this something that has been happening 
uh, previously because of weather, or is it um, this is is this a really COVID outbreak? Because there was a lot of pneumonia uh, re being reported in June and July. I mean, as by us utilizing this. Uh, previously known data sets was good, but also by bringing in data sets that we had ne nobody ever had ever thought about using Uber data for public health was actually an innovative way of looking at it. And how has it been used? I, 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 Dustin, Dustin actually mentioned about contact tracing. You know, when, when, when we didn't actually use contact tracing because of the, of the sensitivity of the data and we, we, we were not considered secure enough. Uh, well, we worked with uh, the University of Nairobi. I have to shout out to the University of Nairobi because you partnered with the University of Nairobi to work on this project. Uh, it, it, the, 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 there was a major decision that we should not access that uh, uh, that tracking data. But there was a team within the government that was using uh, telco data to actually track mobility. Previously, we had used uh, uh, we had we, we had proposed using uh, this this telco data to track like the the infection of of cholera the, the spread of cholera within the country. But so by using we said this is a model that we had used before. Saying there was a huge cholera outbreak last year, 2019 years, 2018 and 2019 there were huge cholera outbreak. What if you use the same process of, with contact tracing? But it was more granular right now because we could be able to do a tree uh, saying Shiko is sick, uh, who, who was Shiko uh, in touch with in the past 24 hours. It was so much easier to do it, to, to utilize like a tree way of, of just finding who are the people I was in contact with using just telco data and using um, mobility data to be able to find where I was. So that is what innovation is. It's you creating new forms of data, but also utilizing existing forms of data to 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 for decision making and that's an example actually as i was preparing uh, for this i went around it to find what are the different what, how have people used uh data in the past few months there are quite a number of interesting things and i want to shout out to um a zambian and a malawian startup that used ai data to be able to inform people in their country on how on how to tackle uh, COVID. And this, I mean, they're really young people who used, who created like chatbots that would answer simple questions around, um, around COVID. And the Zambian guys, I want to just shout out their name. What was most impressive for me, for them, is that they used, um, very simple mobile phones, like, like cheaper smartphones, not your nice, nice uh, phones to actually be able to help people access information about uh, to scrap the internet on 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 data and inform the people with them in uh, let me just get their name they are called sis joy in the, uh, sorry it's zimbabwe and they're called sis joy and they use an ai powered chatbot to actually help like have this conversation with with people who wanted more information about about COVID. In Kenya, we had a lot of, because there was no cash, no handling of cash money, like paper money, we, we had a lot of startups and Musafiri was one of them that uh, that was that came up that you could be able to pay using your, your transportation, using M-Pesa, USSD. And what this helped us do is collect uh, mobility data of people uh, inadvertently because once I pay using M-Pesa, the, the data, the transaction data is actually kept in the system and I'm able to, if if somebody had COVID in that Matatu, we are able to easily track them because you already have, we had all of them. Uh, in this Agro Analytics in Namibia, who 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 used also contact tracing and this is namibia and the university of namibia as well they 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 use this a uh, shout out to my friend uh, Luch, uh, who, who works there and they use this to help in in reducing the damage of uh, of uh, of the lockdown on the economy by helping reduce con uh, uh, what is it called the close down of the economy so there, there are many examples that were used and I'm, I'm picking only african ones because there's a bias to that with me uh but there are many people who use actually uh data and data methodologies like machine learning and ai to to, to be able to to inform uh the response to the to the to the to the pandemic thank you very much thank you for that very insightful response and uh Certainly some interesting use cases there. Last point leads in really well to the next question. I mean, you touched on how in some ways we're unlocking a number of data sources that perhaps we didn't have or didn't use in the past. Um, so I, I just want to explore that a little bit further. So, you know, the data sources and data sets, one, you know, what sort of access and quality do we have right now? And, and what are the gaps, if any? So, you know, are there other data sets that ideally we would like to have 
um, particularly in the, the African context. Um, thank you, Kathleen. Maybe uh, um, I'll, I'll go first. So in terms of just uh, particularly if you focus on big data sources, uh, like these are the, the, the new data sources that we're talking about, let's say data coming from telecom companies, data coming from social media, um, like said, high resolution satellite imagery, um, and any other kind of data coming from private companies, which you, which you can consider kind of new data sources and big data sources. Of course, we also cons uh, just add in the conventional data, not, not to forget that, but just focusing on the these kind of new data sources, one of the issues with data access is that, let's take for example, like data coming from telecom companies. Uh, so we're talking about data on telephone usage. So by its very nature, it's very, it's highly sensitive data. Nobody wants to share this data. So accessing the, the biggest challenge is accessing the data. Um, but even in cases where we are trying to access not not very sensitive data, but the the private companies, which are the telecom companies, are, are not sure whether, whether they should share this data. They think there's some value, and if they share the data, they are kind of like losing their competitive advantage. So there is that lack of lack of knowledge from the uh, from the telecom companies but there's also lack of legal framework in most of the countries to, to say okay this is a kind of you know telecom data which can be shared this one can be shared so that legal framework is not there in the first place so um, accessing this data is, is a big challenge um in in, in terms of the uh, another gap, or not a gap, but in terms of the, the quality, of course, the quality varies a lot depending on the data, right? So in most of the countries in Africa, the data quality is, is it's, uh, understandably low in some cases. Uh, and then when, when it comes to the big data sources, like the data coming from telecom companies or social media data, the code is low simply because of the nature of the data. So, for example, in um, if it's social media data, not everyone is using uh, Facebook, not everyone is using Twitter. So, basically, the data there is very biased. So, it's very challenging to use this data for, you know, if you are using it for public health response, for example, you have to be very aware of the bias and how to treat the data to reduce those biases. So that's a big quality issue when we are uh, dealing with uh, big data sources. Um, so I'm not sure if you want me to go on to, to talk about the, uh, just how to deal with the issue of the data sets in general, like this idea of how to, uh, or, or who to involve to, to deal with the issue of data sets in Africa. Yeah, I think let's let's touch on that a little bit. So, who do we need to have at the table to build these these Africa focused data sets? And we also had a question from the audience, and, and I think let's weave it in now because it's it's very pertinent in terms of, you know, do we need some sort of regulatory framework to protect the users, or is there something already in place? Um, and some of the ethics around it. We have a couple of questions yeah. around that. So perhaps we can talk about those two things together. Yeah, let, let me just yeah uh, address those. So for me, I was uh, I think I was very kind of excited by this question of who do we need to to bring in to create data sets in Africa. So number one, of course, is we need the government. Uh, so we know there's a lot of data being collected by the government. So the government, of course, has data. So they need to to learn to share that data. Uh, having worked in the government in Africa, at least I know that there's a lot of proprietary practices where everyone wants to keep their data to themselves and they don't want to share. But another important role for the government is just the legal framework, right? Setting up the legal framework for data access. This is particularly true for these big data sources we're talking about. So let's, let's say like telecom data. So they need to, uh, there's literally, there's no legal framework for accessing telecom data or for accessing other type of data generated by private companies. 
Um, number two, I think in terms of players or stakeholders, I'm putting number two as the telecom companies. So, I mean, we can think of private companies in general, but I'm still singling out the telecom companies simply because, as we know, we're living in the digital age. Uh, the penetration rate of cellular phone usage in, in, in Africa is over 100%. So there's just massive data being generated from from mobile devices. So And this data is often uh, captured by telecom companies. So I think these have to be on board for us to you know to harvest a lot of data from from the citizens and for us to access the data being generated by the citizens through mobile devices uh, of course number three is just other private companies uh transport companies they generate a lot of data from taxis if you put a taxi a gps in a taxi uh so you know other private companies banks and so on uh, you know the banks are involved in mobile payments so those have to be on board. Number three, we need uh, uh, another stakeholder is just a big tech companies. These are not in Africa, but you know companies like Facebook, Google, Uber. They're not based in Africa, but still they're collecting a lot of data from African citizens, right, or from the countries where they operate. So I think the governments in Africa need to to have some kind of strategy to kind of force these companies to donate some of the data or to give up, give away some of the data so that it benefits the, the countries in Africa. Um, and then, of course, uh, another stakeholder, important stakeholder is just the citizens, the, you know, the citizens having this attitude of voluntarily collecting data. So we know this kind of volunteer data collection, which is often good. So those are some of the key stakeholders I think should be on the should be on the uh on, on, on the table in order to generate kind of Africa focused data sets. Uh, I want to to, to, to to allow Shiko to, to respond to, 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 to that question as well. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, thank you, Dustin. I think you've you've covered um a, a good chunk of the thing. I always, I mean, there's always a joke like, even in our team and the Indian data, data science world that data science is 90% clean up the data and 10% the actual analytics and visualization. And I think that the biggest challenge uh, in most of the data that we've come across uh, uh, in Africa is incompleteness of the data. So because we use different systems and modes of collecting the data, everybody has their own standards of collecting data we realize that it's very incomplete. So without a standardized way of collecting data, even from health facilities, from uh, from the different programs that are run by different NGOs and different funders, there's uh, incompleteness of the data. And number two is th this data, some of it sits in different silos. So there's not, there's very little collaboration in terms of, da of, of, of data sharing. Because as, as uh, Dustin said, everybody wants to silo themselves and hold on to their data because, I mean, data is, 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 is a new oil. But I always say if data is the new oil, you cannot co consume crude oil. I mean, what you have is crude oil. We have to refine it. We have to define what products are. Do we want gas? Do we want gasoline? Do we want uh, 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 air airplane fuel? Do we want... Uh, speed i mean what is it called uh diesel what kind of products are we coming out of but people are locking this crude for oil and so it's not being useful to anybody so that is my my my, my biggest challenge is that it's just complete the incompleteness of it and the siloing of it makes it very hard to actually work and um what COVID did, COVID had to force people to open up their silo because it was a huge pandemic, yeah? But this should be the norm, yeah? It should, it, it should not take a pandemic to get people to share data around, especially health and population and and and, um, and education. People, it should not take a pandemic to do that. And I, I believe, and it's something that we've spoken a lot about in, in different um audiences uh, in Kenya and uh, some of East Africa, is we need to have a standard way of what are those minimum um, um, requirements of data, especially health data that needs to be collected for actually to help move the needle. What are those, if, if somebody is going through diabetes, what are those minimum things that needs to be taken care of before before we, we talk about data? What are those minimum data points that we need to be collecting as a whole to be able to make decisions? Even Not, not even for a pandemic, but just 
normal health uh, uh, response yeah how do, how do we make sure that we have enough uh, service providers in a county if we don't know how many people are sick with n and how many symptoms n are seen in that in in that county so that is my 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 one thing i want to first to quickly respond to dr cecil who is asking is it ethical for companies like uber and other social media ch channels to share user data it was anonymized data. So we didn't know where Cecil actually went. We just knew there are N thousands or N millions of people who are moving from one city to the other, which was very important at that point because it was the only source of data, Matatu data and Uber data and all this mobility data were the only source of data to actually be able to inform mobility in the absence of telco data. Yeah, so it, it was ethical in, in as far as we are protecting in as far as we are protecting the data, the personalized data of people, we're not doing PII, you know, personalized identifiable data uh, information, we, that was not disclosed to us. So that is very important to actually put out there that they gave us and we protected it. We didn't share with everybody. We, we actually didn't share the actual raw data or anything. Like for example, from Facebook, we only shared insights that we got from that data. So that, that, that I hope answers it. Uh, going back to frameworks, uh, this is something I'm passionate about. I think we spoke about this yesterday when we, uh, we were having this discussion is, who do we bring onto the table? I want to do a plug. In the course of this response, we partnered with the University of Nairobi because A, they have the capacity and the capability to bring their academics and people on the table. For example, we needed like epi epi epidemiologists on a quick call. We got this. And we formed um, um, a, a, as the Center for Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis. So it's C-E-M-A dot Africa. If you go there, you learn more about it. So C E M A. So I know in Africa we, we say E different ways. So E for elephant. So cat, elephant, uh, marble, Africa dot Africa. Uh, and the center was to try and start institutionalizing some of these lessons that we were learning from responding to COVID. And this is because we realized that we were doing all this work and maybe at the end of COVID might just disappear in the thin air and it's like nothing happened. All these experts that we were we were, we were bringing together to solve a really huge and important problem. What happens? Do we want another pandemic to try and try, try and solve for this, to try and find this, these capabilities that were in country and that were solving for this? So bringing academia together, bringing government people together and bringing us as private sector and other people from different, we had we had from, had from the other different places together to be able to say, this is a framework that we are putting together such that if there's a question that is coming from government about responding to N, we have a group of people who are ready and are capable of doing that. But in addition to that is to build a pipeline of capabilities that is able to respond to this. For example, during the last few months, we've been training government people in M&E using data, how to use R to run to run some of those uh, questions that you're asking us that can easily respond because you already have access to that data. And, and building capability within government, but also the academic part of it say, shows us that we have a pipeline of, of graduate students who are coming in and are interested in data what if we convince them that maybe uh, doing some of this work around epidemiology and disease modeling is something that they actually are interested in and we're creating this pipeline of students and academic and we're we are, we are, we are plugging in the private sector part of it to ensure that they actually are able to have this capability the government will have a on-call group of experts as our president used to call us who will be able to respond to them using data. And it was very fulfilling for me as a person, knowing that the government is actually listening to experts and acting on those decisions and, list, and, and saying, okay, the experts said we should do this and they actually listened and did not do or did something. So the framework should be bringing different people with different mindsets together to, to form these groupings and it's the it's semi in kenya and, and other groups in kenya in africa and then creating an, as, a, an assortment of people that we can be able to spread this across the continent as caitlin you asked we should be able to say we have this a best practice that is working out in this country how can we duplicate this same uh, way of doing and bringing uh, capabilities together across the continent because it, it is working and it's working really really well that is my contribution thank you very much Thank you so much for, for that context. And um, I think you started to touch on some really important ideas around 
you know, how do we institutionalize? How do we put in place the right infrastructure and, and frameworks and, and that sort of thing? Um, which really leads into, you know, what are the best practices for big data innovators, for governments, for large companies or, or research institutions? And I'd like to invite Dunstan to, to speak to that a little bit. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's uh, another in interesting question and also a little bit depends on somebody's opinion, but I, I, I'll just share, I think, some of what I, what I believe are the best practices um, for working in, in this space, I think, in big data, uh, in, in, in machine learning, in data science, and I guess in technology in general. So, I, I think in, in big data, one of the best practices that I would like to encourage you, what I see is just the use of open source software. So what we've seen recently is that the use of open source software has increased dramatically. So we've seen companies like Google, they have open sourced their machine learning uh, frameworks. Um, we've seen companies like Facebook, they, op they open source their machine learning frameworks like for computer vision, uh, for Google, we've seen TensorFlow. So there are just many companies who are open sourcing their frameworks, who are contributing a lot in open source software. So just to encourage uh, folks in, in Africa and everywhere that this is one of the best practice in, in this area is to use open source uh, software when uh, processing the data and, and all of the, the work we do in big data. And also, so related to that is, you know, just encouraging institutions in Africa to contribute to open source software. So as open source software is open, so when you look at contributions for open source software, like for machine learning uh, and just open source software in general, there's little contribution from Africa. So I'm going to share a little bit of a statistic later on, which shows that there's very little contribution from the Africa region to open source software. So I think one of the best practices is just also to contribute to this kind of uh, software. And another best practice I'd like to share is, of course, um, the issue of sharing, right? So when we do data analysis these days, we know that some of the things cannot be shared, uh, a lot of things, because the, the, the data is very confidential. Uh, maybe the material or the, the, the knowledge is proprietary for the, for the company and so on. So that cannot be shared. But it, in many other places, I think it's encouraged to, to share the, the knowledge that we generate as well as the code, uh, the software that we use for processing the data or for, for building the, the products. And also related to that, another best practice is just making things very reproducible. So uh, just encouraging folks to use uh, technologies like GitHub. So for making sure that whatever products we build can be easily, you know, uh, can be easily reproduced uh, and can be taken by someone else and improved upon. So that kind of spirit of produce, uh, uh, putting out their reproducible workflows through use of like GitHub and other platforms and use of open source software like Python. Uh, nothing against the other software is just trying to... Uh, and I guess another thing is also just for research institutions trying to solve problems which are relevant to the society, right? So when we are looking at research work, so in big data, there's a lot of uh, trial and error. There's a lot of experimentation. So I guess we have, we always have to try to solve problems which are relevant to society instead of like uh, trying to, um, you know, to, 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 to solve some kind of hypothetical problem. So that's, those are some of the best practices that I can think of. I hope Kathleen, I'm answering the question. But yeah, that's what I had in mind when I was thinking of the, the best practices that I, would, that I would recommend. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dunstan. I think you hit on some really important points. Certainly, um, the, the importance and value of open source in general when we talk about data, but uh, you raised some good points about the software side as well. 
Um, Shiko, I'd like to give you a, a couple of minutes to also add in if you have any best practices that you want to share uh, before we move to to discuss sort of the scale piece and and some final thoughts. Uh, thank you very much. So I'll, I'll pick some of the lessons that we have learned uh, over the past uh, eight months in doing this in terms of best practices. So we, we not only are we part of the University of Nairobi SEMA program, but we are also part of um, a, 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 a Ministry of Health, a government actually run committee on data. And what I've learned is that we we have brought people from CDC, from the w, I mean, WHO, from uh, from different NGOs, Camry, Welcome Trust, to come in and, and just brainstorm and peer review our own work. And that has really helped us think through, like, we are going to be giving this advice to government. Are we sure it's the best piece of work that you can do. We've had people looking at, at at our models, and we look at other people's models. We have had people looking at our at our at our data sets and saying, "Where did you get that data set? It, it's not complete, or there's something off about that data because they've been exposed to that data in a different context." That that idea of peer reviewing uh, from across the sector and that breaks a first breaks the the silos. Uh, between the different organizations. But the second thing, it also increases knowledge on a particular area of things. So for example, I understand more about uh, health resource distribution in Kenya than I ever would have if I was not part of this um, of this committee, we call it a committee. So that peer reviewing, I would love to have that kind of peer reviewing across the continent because it's a best practice that you can learn from each other. You can learn how what are the different tools. Uh, I see Dunstan is a big proponent of uh, open open source. There, 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 there are some really cool proprietary tools that can can happen and you can get free licenses because you're doing a public good thing. And just being able to learn from each other is a very important uh, best practice that I'll say is something I have taken away from this pandemic in terms of data. Thank you. Uh, should I go to the scale question? Uh, sure, you can you can jump into that. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I mean, if we muted the data part, I always say you have to do something that should be used by the continent. Uh, scale is a very important thing. Yes, we you start a model with or so, something or product or uh a business with a with non-scalable methods but for it to have the kind of impact that that should should it should have it should not need to be scalable so one of the things that we need to explore as the people in this call Dunstan, who's working for the world bank is how do we make sure that african governments are actually able to adapt some of these tools that have been have worked very well somewhere else for example the the guys in Z in zimbabwe who are doing the ai chatbot how do we make sure that they scale uh, regardless of language across the continent how do we make the au start supporting data as a way of making decisions in in, in within within the au how and that means a lot of um, lobbying and policy making and writing boring documents uh, from a science point, point of view we think it's boring documents for policy that will make sure that these decisions are being made using data how do we convince african governments to adapt this and it has to start from a government point of view and at a scale of an african or a regional block for example east africa and i'll give an example of a very interesting project that is happening right now in east africa called the commons uh, common pass. I don't know if you've heard about pass that allows people to travel after after making sure that you don't have COVID or at, at the moment they're working on making sure that you have a vaccine. Uh, it's like your, 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 your yellow fever card, but in a digital format. Um, so like that one, it has to have a blessing and a goodwill from everywhere for it to work. And scale comes from bringing different stakeholders on the table and showing them this is how you win by making sure that this this is a way of thinking. It's a mindset shift more than anything else. It's because you can talk about we can talk data on this call as much as possible, but the people who are, who have the decision making cap capability, if they don't understand it, then we are all just talking shop, to be honest. But if you can convince them and show them and demonstrate to them the power of data, that's where skill starts. And then they become the, the, the ambassadors to using the data. The second thing we can do is talking to each other. Like this conversation, I've, I've learned a lot from what Dunstan is doing, and I'm going to follow up with him. I, I've seen somebody from Imperial College. I'm going to follow up with them, you know. Um, 
seeing what other people are doing and saying, I can adapt that part of what you've done and you can adapt this part of what I've done. Just speaking to each other across the continent is very important. Hence, back to the committee analogy I had is, how do we create this cross-continent uh, framework of people talking to each other about data in this case it's health the next time it will be about education the other time it will be something even more important how do we start talking about this as a continent my act for has just been launched a, a few months ago maybe we should take the act for uh mode of doing things with data if we can be able to open up our economy uh our economies and our trading to everybody it means we are trading uh, with money, but also we, we should be able to be, to be able to trade using te technology and data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dunstan, uh, you know, I know in your context, you've worked with different countries and certainly across the region uh, of Africa in general. So maybe you can comment as well on, on scaling solutions across the continent. And, uh, you know, are there any learnings that, that you see are really important for, for enabling this? Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, um, I'll try to see if I can. That I think the main thing when it comes to scaling, what I've learned, um, like if you're going from one country to another, is that it's each country has got its own uh, challenges when you're trying to uh, to implement a solution. So I think one of the uh, the lesson I can say here is to just be very uh, to pay attention to the particular needs of, of of a country. So, because uh, these countries are different in in their own ways, but if generally speaking, I think what can uh, improve the scaling is, of course, trying to make sure that uh, in the first place we build scalable solutions, uh, because some solutions uh, in in general they are they are they are not easily scalable. So, for example. Um, if you're building a solution with, with Facebook data, we know that Facebook data is, once you have an agreement with Facebook, it's much easier to scale that solution across Africa because it's, it's much uh, easier to access that data with, with the same script. But with telecom data right now, because of lack of uh, frameworks within the countries, it's not as easy to scale any solution when you're using telecom data. So those are some of the things to to consider when we're looking at scaling. But also I think what can improve scaling is just demonstrating success, right? If you can demonstrate massive success in one country, then it's easier to go to another country and say, hey, look at what they did in Kenya here. It worked very, very well. So we just want to do the same in, in Malawi or another country. So scaling becomes easier if you uh, if you demonstrate success in, 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 one, uh, in, in one part of the in, in one country, but also just to allude to what Chico said, involving stakeholders is important. So just making sure that all the key stakeholders are involved. So for example, in Africa, if, if you're working with the uh, African Union, for example, or if you're working with UN and then within UN, you can reach out to all Africa, African countries easily. And in that way, it, becomes a bit easier to scale. Of course, also if you work with the World Bank, where we work with many countries at, at once, it makes it things easier. Um, and I've, finally, another thing on, on scaling is just sharing, right? So um, I'll go back to the open source, but just to say sharing and publishing. So if something has worked in, in, in one country, if you can publish those results, if you can share those results, if it's a kind of product which can be shared. If you share it, then you know we we disseminate and then we increase knowledge about the product and also enable uh, making the scaling a, a bit easier in in a sense. Perfect. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. Um, so we have one final question for the panelists, but I'd also like to remind the audience, if you have any questions, please do send them in the Q&A chat. We do have a couple of minutes at the end for those. Um, but we just want to wrap up by asking, you know, what is the future of these innovations as we recover from the pandemic? And what lessons have we learned that can be used to help mitigate other healthcare challenges as well? Uh, perhaps Dr. Shiko, you can. So one of the things that we have emphasized on is that uh, the, the solutions you are building is not a one-touch solutions. I mean, there are things like the contact tracing or 
the, the, the Facebook, uh, not Facebook, the Google and, and Apple thing uh, that they, they did about contact tracing. That might be an only uh, COVID thing. But most of the stuff that we've done around data are things like are, are replicable and extends past COVID. So, for example, the models that we've created, we are able to utilize in any other outbreak of anything else in Kenya. The models, I've just posted um, a link of, uh, of something that we have done, the infrastructure we've put together on, on health data. We realized we did this to try and understand the, the disease progression for COVID, but we can use it to to track basically all health indicators in the country and not just in Kenya, but in any other country that uses the DHIS2 system, making, making this replicable. This is something we put it out so that anybody who wants to do this in their country and they have DHIS2, they can quickly pick it up and go and replicate. And this making makes decision making it very easy. So it's what Dunstan said is making sure that whatever you're building is easily replicable and scalable. Yeah, and that 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 is the decision. And even the like the setups we are seeing that are doing like Msafiri, we, we are we are seeing that it's going to be used post COVID because everybody is getting used to, to not paying using money in their matatus. The chatbots we are seeing they are going to be repli uh, replicated and repurposed for past post COVID to just general healthcare uh response so those those are the things that people need to start thinking about and we are seeing people actually repurposing their and pivoting their covid response apps to other healthcare apps or other care other other healthcare response even non-healthcare response for example education is my favorite one when it comes to tech and covid is that some of the stuff that were, were, were done for just covid have just basically disrupted the education sector because of their, their existence and they, they, you cannot just assume they are not there when January comes and kids have to go back to school. Kids are now used to going to school using online tools and, and interacting with their teachers using online tools. You can just, just say this did not happen. It will be part of their life. They have a hybrid life of learning using online and using um, and having a physical teacher coming to them. So those are the things is the replicability of, your, of, of the things that you're building, but also scaling not just in numbers, but scaling in uh, use cases, how you use that particular innovation in, in different places is very important. And I'm seeing it happening already. Thank you. And COVID is not finished. So yes, we have a vaccine, but people are still dying. So let's yeah. be careful. Yeah. Very, very good point. And <laughs> uh, absolutely. Thank you. Some, some really interesting insights in terms of you know, how this can be used beyond. And, and I think that's important, but it's also, of course, important to remember that we are not beyond it. And um, this is our reality for, for a while still. Uh, Dunstan, perhaps you can comment as well in terms of, you know, what is the future of these innovations and, and what lessons can we learn? Uh, yes, uh, so I, I think, um, for me, one of the main, list, uh, one of the main lessons that we, we, we that we can learn from here is that we need to uh, institutionalize that that word is hard for me to pronounce <laughs> but it's uh, that's uh, a topic we, we mentioned but maybe we didn't cover but just to institutionalize the many of the mostly for me is the data access right so institutionalizing for me means like putting in place the the framework the legal framework to access data so like telecom data, as I mentioned, one of the hurdles is just accessing the data. And for me, this is kind of very, very personal uh, when it comes to telecom data. As I mentioned, I've been working with telecom data for, the, for a long time now. Uh, and when you put in, put in proposals to access telecom data, most of the time those proposals were were, were rejected, they were shut down, you know, most of the proposals were put in place for accessing data were shut down, and then COVID happened, right? So when we were putting in place those proposals, it was all hypothetical, right? We said we can use this data for monitoring mobility, blah, blah, blah. And, and back then people didn't see the need, and then COVID happened and people are scrambling to now to try use telecom data for contact tracing, to try to use telecom data for and as we're doing this, especially in Africa, we don't have any infrastructure in place to access this data. We don't have infrastructure in place to process to process the data because this data is huge. You can't just bring your laptop and process it. 
Uh, we don't have the capacity. Most of the uh, telecom companies in in Africa, the in the smaller ones, they don't have the capacity, the knowledge to process this data. So the infrastructure is just not there to respond to an emergency demand like like COVID. So the main lesson here, for me, uh, at least for me, is that we should work hard to institutionalize, to put in place the legal framework to access the data. Uh, and other infrastructure, the knowledge, um, and then the other things that, that Shiko mentioned of, of course, trying to make sure that the, the solutions can be scaled, making sure that the solutions, of course, are rigorous and they can be replicated and, 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 and so on. But yeah, I just wanted to hit home that point of just making sure that we, uh, we institutionalize these, uh, access data access issues for most of the new data sources. We know how to access survey data. You know, we can go to National Studies Office and get that data, but, but during the time of COVID, as we know, you can't go collect any household data. So that's why we're turning to this kind of this new data source. And, and so we have to find a way to make sure that we have mechanisms to access that data. Perfect. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing all your insights and, and expertise with uh, our audience today. Um, definitely some great takeaways. And uh, there are some links as well for, for anyone who is interested in learning more. Um, you're also welcome to connect with any of our panelists uh, following today. And, um, you know, it's about continuing to, to collaborate and have these discussions in terms of where do we go from here. Um, so thank you so much.